Uh, last point is about sumo. You went to see some sumo at the weekend. Yeah, uh, shout out to buysumotickets.com. He sorted me out with a free ticket on uh, Sunday night. I got off the train on uh, the first day I arrived in Tokyo. Got lost uh, about three different places. And just in buysumotickets.com. In an island jersey, it's like that. Can't speak. Got a free ticket for a uh, beautiful sport that you're seeing on screen right now. This is the autumn tournament. Uh, it takes place in the Rio Goku Kukuki Camp. Uh, and uh, anybody who's actually well versed in Japanese will tell me I've absolutely slaughtered that pronunciation. But it's a beautiful, traditional setting for sport. Uh, it is a beautiful, traditional sport itself. And uh, it's pretty easy to see what's going on. You don't need to watch too many sumo bouts to know exactly the rules of sumo. Hit each other hard. You try to knock the opposition uh, outside of the ring. We saw uh, on screen there a kind of David versus Goliath bout, which is my particular <laughs> favourite. My highlight from uh, the night, but David unfortunately lost on that occasion. Yeah, that's, that's not how it's supposed to work. You know, he's supposed to take out a slingshot. Uh, right, really isn't. good stuff, Owen. Um, here's the Roscommon man who represented Ireland at World Championship level as a sumo wrestler and went on to become the Joe Rogan, it says here, of sumo broadcasting. Owen has been speaking to John Gunning. Have a look. I'm delighted to say I'm here in Tokyo with the man that is John Gunning. John, how are you? I'm grand, yeah. I'm not too bad, thanks Owen. Good to be here with you. I think it's fair to say that most of our audience back home might not know who you are, but if I asked many English-speaking people around the city who you are, they might know who you are. Yeah, I'd say uh, I'm a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a big deal, you know, take that Ron Burgundy line. Uh, yeah, I've been out here 20 years. I'm the main sumo commentator, or I'm one of the main sumo commentators on Japanese national television. I have uh, an art uh, column, weekly column that becomes daily sumo tournaments, and uh, yeah, I'm kind of one of the, the faces of sumo in Japan. We'll get into that in just a moment because your media career is, is very interesting, but ultimately you're a guy from Roscommon who comes out to Japan and becomes a sumo wrestler. From sheep stealer to sumo wrestler, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a... Uh, I have a friend of mine, Paul Burns, who is uh, big up in sport in RTE, you know, and uh, he said it'd be like uh, somebody from deep dark Kyoto coming and ended up like being head of the GA, you know, so it's, it's an unusual path and something that if you'd said to me, you know, 20 years ago, that that's what I was going to end up doing, I would have laughed at you. I wouldn't even known who sumo wrestlers were back mm. then, but uh, yeah, I came out to Japan, came on a holiday first, absolutely loved it, uh, didn't want to leave was with Paul that I mentioned there and a couple others. That was in the year 2000, eight months later. I'd sold everything in Ireland, packed up all my stuff and just came out and moved without a word of Japanese. Uh, spent three years in Osaka working there, then moved up to Tokyo. And I had a kind of background in sports media, a little bit anyway, you know. And um, just gradually, when I came out, I was slim and I was playing soccer. You know, I was 60 kilos. Uh, couldn't run anymore once I got a bit older, you know, I got sick of chasing 16 year olds around hot summer 40 degree fields, you know, so I hurt my knee, couldn't run, decided I'd take up an easier sport, <laughs> which was sumo, and ended up breaking like nearly every bone in my body then over the next 10 years and you know, but it's, uh, yeah, I, I moved into the sumo area and I became more involved in the sport on an amateur level and then closer to the professional people and then in the media side of it. Yeah, so how does that happen? Who co do you look around for a game to play that isn't as taxing in certain areas and you kind of look to get involved in the culture and then suddenly you start to take it seriously or, or how does this happen? I think when I came out first there wasn't the internet, it was, broadband was just starting up in Japan at that time, you know, like 20 years ago, but uh, the only thing I could understand on television was sumo, right. you know, it's, you know, and television was the main media for me at that time, you know, so it's, it's down or out, it's very simple. And when you watch it on television, then you see the athleticism of the people, and that's really shocking, because like at most people, when I came out first, I had the image of, you know, fat, cuddly pandas belly bouncing each other, you know, in, in a gentle way out of the ring. And what it is, is it's American football linemen. You yeah. know, crashing into each other with yeah, huge power and so that was fascinating and then I went to a tournament at a professional tournament and I saw that and I was hooked immediately you know once, you, once you're there with the sights and the sounds and the smells and everything it it's really gets its hooks into you and once I gave up the soccer I was looking for something else to do and I was a big fan of sumo at that stage and you know I kind of I've never had any sense really so I was like you know I think I'll give that a go mm. so I contacted a local amateur club uh, that was teaching mostly kids but also had like some adult members and went along watched the practice and thought I could do that and uh, it's just pushing people you know <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they said sure come back next week and give it a go 
and I spent four months and I didn't win a single fight that first four months. I just wow. got pummeled to bits. Like I, How know, bad is the pummeling? It's bad. Okay. I mean, it's bad. I mean, they're, they're easy enough on me at the start. And, you know, I was, I, I, they used to put me up against... They got put up against the guy I remember the first fight. And I looked at him and I thought he was probably like college level or something like that. And it's like a bit bigger than me, a bit heavier than me. And I was like, so he's a college student, is it? I was like, no, no, he's only 12. Wow. You know, it's just a gigantic guy. And uh, yeah, yeah, 11, no, not 11, but it's a 12, 13 year olds, guys who were just like junior high school. They just had more skills than I could deal with at the beginning. Like I just, you know, you have the small quick guys and you go in and they'd be gone. You know, be around the back of you and, and the big guys, they would just blow you out of the ring, you know. So without that experience and without that background in it, it took me four months before I could win a single fight. And what are those younger guys doing? Like, what is the skill? Because as you say, p people like me look at Simon, it's like, the bigger you are, the more powerful you are, the better you are. But there's obviously a huge amount of technique. In amateur sumo, there are weight classes at the international level, so it doesn't apply so much. But in professional sumo, which you only can join from age 15 onwards, um, there are three things, really. the size, technique and physique. Uh, the, sorry, physique, technique and uh, heart. You know, that's that's uh, that's the main thing, I think, really. So uh, what's that thing you say, you know, it's not the, the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. Like, that really applies in sumo. You can get away with various body shapes and sizes. I often compare it to like um, Street Fighter, one of those video yeah. games. You know, <laughs> you've got all different kinds of characters and each one has their own strengths and weaknesses. So if you can play up to it, like if you're small, like there's a guy in the top division now and he is smaller than either of us. Right. You know, he's a couple of, like he's, he's probably only... I think he's like 176 centimeters tall and he only weighs like 80, 90 kilos. But his skill level is off the charts. Wow. Eno is his name and he's a superstar. Because he, I, I was going to ask, obviously tongue in cheek, yeah. how much weight would I have to put on to ever last in the ring? But th th you're telling me that there is a chance. Yeah, there's a chance, yeah. There might be a few other obstacles <laughs> <laughs> between you and, and sumo stardom, but you know, you know, never lose hope. Um, <laughs> I would say probably in the top division, the average weight is about 160 kilos now, but the ideal size is probably something like um, 189, 90 centimeters and about 150, 160 kilos. I mean, it, that's the size of, you know, there's a, there's a variance obviously, mm -hmm. and there are guys who are successful at different sizes and shapes, but it's just getting back a little bit, you asked me like, how, what was the pummeling mm -hmm. like? It's incredibly physical as a sport. so. It's like American football and you're banging your heads together, you know, impact after impact and you're not wearing any protective gear and you are on a hard surface and it's full bore. Like there's no sparring in sumo, you know, when we fight in practice, it's the same as fighting in a ring. So there's slaps to the face, there's thrust to the throat, you know, and I, I broke my humerus lengthways, I fractured my skull, broke teeth. Uh, lost feeling in this arm for four months. I uh, couldn't move it actually for a year and a half, basically, you know. So it's, it's incredibly violent as a sport. And then the professional side of it, it's incredibly violent as a lifestyle. You know, there's hazing. It's, it's essentially a 17th, uh, an 18th century activity that hasn't changed since mm. the mid 1700s. So everything, emotionally taxing, physically taxing, mentally taxing, and there's no escape from it. So it's an extremely tough sport, yeah. you know. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't particularly recommend that you take it up, even if you could. You know, usually when I get guys who come from abroad who want to join sumo, the first thing I do is spend six months trying to dissuade them because it's, it's not what people imagine. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's one of the hardest things you can possibly do. Talk to us about that hazing culture in sumo because it is something that I've read. They're, ha they're having a few bullying scandals in um, in stables uh, around the city or around the country. Is, is that correct? Yeah, it's there's a peculiar mindset in sumo. It's first of all, it, there's a lot of machismo in the sport, mm. you know. So guys break a finger. This coach says tape it up and keep going. You know, I know a guy who tore an ACL and tore half of the other ACL. He just got a brace and kept fighting. Wow, okay. Like so, no surgery. You know, just kept fighting. And you see that a lot. Um, when I when I told you I broke my arm, right? So it was in a fight, and this bone, the humerus, broke lengthways into three, and shot, like it tore all the nerves in the top, upper arm. So for four months, I had no ability to move this arm, and it was just tied to my body. You know, I lost sight and hearing because I hit my head so hard in the ring when the when the arm broke. So in the hospital, I couldn't see in here for some, you know, for a few minutes and face was black and blue. And, you know, I had to sleep on the couch for the first month because I couldn't lie down with the, with the armas. And after a week or two out, 
I went into the club and I told him, here, you know, I'm still alive and I'll be back next year and probably be a year and a half before everything gets, you know, back to normal or back to as, as normal as it can be. And the coach looked at me and he said, you're not going to train. Mm. And I was, wearing, I was wearing a sling. I had my head, you know, covered in bandages and everything. And I said, how can I train? And he's like, there's nothing wrong with your legs, is there? Your legs are fine. Do some, you know, leg stumps and nice. squats, you know. So I did, you know. I just did some squats there. Like, you know, barely every movement was agony, you know. So that's just the normal part of sumo. Like, that's just the mentality they have. And so you get guys that come in and say if they come from abroad and the stable mate says to them, you know, give me water in Japanese. And of course, they don't speak a word of Japanese and they go, what? And they get punched in the face. Mm. So next like the next day they know what water means like right. you, you'll never forget it that's one reason that they learn Japanese so quickly but I mean you, you get guys who are I don't know if I can swear on this or not, you know you get guys who are assholes you know because mm. they're there in every sport and in every walk of life you know you get all kinds of people in sumo the same as you do in anywhere else but even the guys who are solid sound people they still subscribe to this ultra macho mentality so it changes people almost it does change people it changes you physically and it changes you mentally but it's in the sumo world you have it's really top down and it's really top heavy so the stable master is the same as a feudal lord so most stables don't allow the guys who join at first to use the internet or have phones or even go out to the store on their own you have no rights you don't get a salary. 98% of all people who join sumo never get a salary. Right. It's only the top 5% who ever make it even to the salary ranks at all. And you, yeah, you have no rights until you make the top two divisions out of six divisions. So in those lower four divisions, you're essentially an indentured servant. You can quit at any time, but once you quit, you can never come back. So sumo is a one-time, one-chance thing. And the only way you can progress in sumo is by beating the people around you. So it's a zero-sum game. So physicality is important and skill is important. But that, when I was talking about the mental part of it, I'm not just talking about in the ring. I'm talking about outside the ring. The ability to go into a stable where everyone else is trying to claw to the top of the ladder as well. And even though you're their stable mate, there's also that rivalry there. So... Can you take a beating? Can you take the harassment? Can you take the, you know, the physical stuff? Can you stand your ground? Yeah. You know, and like, there is a problem with it and it goes too far. And if you have a stable master who's not really, really on top of things, you will get a Lord of the Flies type environment okay. where it just goes out of, out of control completely. But even in the places where it's not like that, it's hard. It's tough. And if, if you are not mentally able to stand it, you'll quit. And that's what most people do. You obviously were mentally able to stand it for a while. At what point, at what point does, do you realize that actually it, it, this is not for me in the long term? I guess it's the same for, as you say, 98% of people. Well, you got to make... So I was not a professional. Sure, we, have yeah. to, we have to make the yeah. distinction there. So what I did was amateur sumo because you have to join professional sumo by the time you're 22. And if you're a foreigner coming from abroad, that essentially drops to about 17. I mean, okay. once you're over 17, they, they really don't want you, unless you've had huge success in amateur tournaments. So sumo, there are two separate branches of sumo. One is amateur sumo, which is purely a sport, which is what I did. And that has world championships. I represented Ireland in three world mm. championships. It has tournaments like you, you go and you train at the weekends and then you know, you're know you a college student or you're a worker, whatever you do. That's no different from any other sport. And then there is professional sumo which is only in Japan and that is a lifestyle. You join that and it's like joining the military or joining a monastic order and you're you know fighting monks type of thing. And so there's a little bit of overlap in Japan. So I trained with pros and you know I introduced guys into pros and there's, there is that overlap as I said. But for me, I was never in that pro world. I mean, if I'd been young enough, when I came to Japan, I definitely would have joined it. I would sure. have been stupid enough to, to do it, you know? How, how far do you think you would have gotten? Oh, not far at all. I mean, I, I had some success as an amateur against like some ex-pros and something like that. But, you know, I even in my club, kids that were like 15, 16 and went on to the pro level, like never did anything, you know, that I had a t tough time dealing with. I just wasn't big enough. And I didn't have the skill or the background, you know. I mean, the guys like Eno that I talked about earlier, they're outrageously talented and have been doing it since they were four years of age, you know. So, uh, I can you can see my results in the World Championship that I definitely wouldn't have made it very far, you okay. know. Um, I think I've uh, 
but I've risen to the top of the media world, so you know. <laughs> like, well, it's interesting because I was about to ask that when it comes to the media, and I, I guess there, there, it would have been similar as well when you were a sumo wrestler as well at an amateur level. Do you ever find that the people here are snobby in any way when it comes to people from the outside coming in uh, to talk about sumo, to analyze sumo, to partake in sumo? Uh, like, was it tough as an Irishman? That's a. That's really more of a Japan question. So Japan is. It's not homogenous, really. I mean, there are ethnic groups, but, you know, as far as most people are concerned, Japan is a homogenous country, mm. you know. So, you will, there's one thing you have to really understand about Japan. Once you come here as an outsider, you'll always be an outsider. You know, Japan is a country with inside and outside groups. It, you know, there's uh, Uchi and Soto. There's, there's a lot to that. It's not just on a national level. There's like, if you're part of a group as a team or a company or an organization or a club, you'll always either be inside or outside. So those groups are, are very important. And the biggest group is Japan and Japanese. So even if you change your nationality, it's not like the US. Mm. You're not, or it's not like, um, I remember Ireland in the Celtic Tiger thing, I used to be reading, I think like there was a series on one of the TV channels about the new Irish. You know, that was, I think, one of the titles they used. You would never see that in Japan. Mm. You know, you're still Mongolian, you're still Irish. So as long as you, I, I, you know, Demographically, things are changing because there's a lot more, say, mixed marriages or international marriages. So in the future, that may not be the case. But for right now, that's still the way it is. So I understood that when I came here and I knew that it doesn't matter if I'm here 40 years, if I'm, you know, the Patspalan of sumo and I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting there, you know, you know, driving people crazy with my commentary on television and, you know, annoying left, right and center, but actually knowing the game inside out. It doesn't matter how long I'm doing that, or I'll still be a foreigner yeah. in, in the eyes of most people, and that's fine. You know, I was I was born there and abroad. So if you if you understand that and you you can accept it from the start, you'll be fine. So I, I didn't have a problem that way. I actually have more problems, ironically enough, with people in America and other countries who don't like the fact that I criticize pure Japanese culture. How do you mean? Okay, so I wrote an article, uh, there was a, a big hoo-ha about women in the ring a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah. uh, an incident happened where women went up to help a guy who had collapsed in the ring and one of the sumo announcers kind of panicked and said, you know, no women in the ring, get out of the ring. And, you know, it caused a national scandal, rightly so. And I wrote an article about that saying it was time to ditch that ban. Mm. The ban on women in the ring was, you know, anachronistic and it wasn't actually as traditional as most people think. And it, it came, you know, in the old days there actually were women sumo wrestlers and, you know, with the way the world is going with gender issues and things like that the whole definition like that binary thing anyway like th there's a ho there was a whole host of reasons i wrote about why that 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 ban had to go and it shouldn't be there and i i mean it was really poking the hornet's nest in terms of like th there's a whole group of people abroad who have this idealized view of japan okay. essentially so japan is perfect and you know like, japan is a great country and i love it obviously it's my home you know but it's a country, and there are, you know, there are issues and there are problems, same as anywhere else. Maybe a lot less than in other places, but still they're there. But because I'm not Japanese born and bred and you know, purely racially Japanese, people mostly in America criticize me. Foreigners shouldn't be going to Japan telling the Japanese what to do. But the irony, of course, in that is I've lived here most of my adult life. This is my home. This is my sport. And I grew up in sumo. You know, I've been involved in sumo on every level. Amateur, media, professional, you know, for decades. And people who have never set foot in Japan are telling me foreigners shouldn't be telling Japanese what to do. So without seeing that irony whatsoever, you know. Yeah. So I generally don't get the same from Japanese people. You know, I mean, I get a lot of surprise. When people meet me at first, you know, obviously they're very surprised. Because, you know, y you still get that sometimes where I say, I'm a sumo commentator on television and, you know, I have column and I've done sumo, blah, blah, blah. And then people say, oh, you like sumo. Do you know? And they'll name like the most obvious sumo wrestler okay, of all time, yeah, you know. Yeah. And oh, you know him. I was like, well, this is my, yeah. you know, this, does that disconnect? Do, do you know Cristiano Ronaldo? Yeah, yeah do you know Ronaldo? Oh, you're, you know, exactly like that, you know. Um, so you said you're the, the Pat Spillane, you didn't say that, you made a comparison to Pat Spillane on television there in terms of you being that uh, in sumo, like w what is the day-to-day the -day in terms of your media dealings, like personally I'm, I'm off to the autumn tournaments this mm. Sunday, that's obviously one of the, the big ones at the moment, is it a year-round thing that you're <laughs> up the walls as a pundit? I probably said Pat Spillane now because uh, I'm from Roscommon, I, I still have 
PTSD from 1980 yeah. in the All Ireland <laughs> final, you know. Well, uh, good thing you didn't say Joe Brawley. He's after being dropped for the panel this weekend for the All Ireland final replay. So good comparison, I think, Spillane. Well, Joe Brawley's kind of after my day, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just remember those Kerry teams of the the early eighties, yeah, you yeah. know, and Roscommon. You know what? You know Roscommon. I'm I'm not a GA person at all. But the fact that we won, I think it was like two All-Irelands in 43 and 44, while the rest of the world was a little bit busy with yeah. other stuff, you know, <laughs> says a lot. But um, yeah, the day-to-day, -day, sumo is a year-round sport. Mm. Essentially, there are six tournaments in, in the odd number of months. For me, I have a weekly column uh, in Japan Times, which becomes daily, and there's one there actually on the table. I can see it in front of me, today's one. So even when the tournaments are not on I've got the stuff I can do and I also I founded my own media company a couple of years ago Inside Sport Japan and so we deal a lot with rugby and American football and a little bit of basketball and other stuff as well so sumo is my main work for we'll say NHK which is the RTE of Japan and the Japan Times which is the Irish Times of Japan <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but outside of that, uh, yeah, American football and rugby, I'm deeply involved in. So obviously, like yourself, you know, the Rugby World Cup is coming on next week, seven days to go. So I'll be in, I think my next day off is March 1st. Right. Uh, and now we're in like early October. So yeah, it's, I, it's full on. Okay, that's, it's, it's a busy enough schedule. We, we should talk briefly about the, the rugby. Mm. For, for any Ireland fans who have yet to board that plane to come over this part of the world, any advice for them? I'm kind of asking that question for myself, to be quite honest. Oh yeah, I mean, there's, you know, you could spend a whole series yeah. talking about things like that. Um, you know, the Irish fans came out in 2002, the World Cup was on then, and there wasn't really any, I mean, that was, there was a lot less information than there is now, so sure. I think, you know, a little bit of a Google around and you'd be fine, and the World Cup would be very well organised. I think, maybe the biggest thing is just be a little bit flexible in your thinking, you know, Japan can be... It, it'll be a wonderful experience and I think 99.99% of the experiences people have when they come here will be positive because Japanese people are exceptional hosts, mm. the country is clean, it's ridiculously safe, you know, there's nowhere you can't walk alone at night with headphones on in a city of 37 million people. Um, if you lose your belongings, if you, you know, lose your a couple of thousand dollars worth of camera equipment as I've done or leave it on a train, you just go to the local police station or lost and found and you'll get it back like you know wallets of cash so you don't need to worry about anything like that but it can be a little bit inflexible and rigid so if you go to a restaurant or a cafe and there's something on the menu that you don't like you don't really say can i get it with fries or you know can i change it that's mm. that's not really you just follow and do the way things are done you know and uh a little bit of flexibility and you'll be fine, I think, you know. Is the Rugby World Cup going to have a sort of real tournament feel? Like, I guess that's a two-pronged question because you can ask the question about Tokyo and then you can ask the question about the rest of the country. Like, it's I've seen a couple of ads up around the city over the last couple of days for the World Cup, but really you, you have no idea that, that this tournament is <laughs> a week away. Elsewhere in Japan, I suspect that might be a bit different. That's kind of interesting that you say that because to me, I think, oh, there's loads of rugby stuff everywhere. Right, you know? okay. It's, um... This is a city, as I said, of 37 million people, and there are so many things going on. So it is hard, of course, for a sport that is not a major sport, really, genuinely, in Japan. I mean, there's a lot more interest than there used to be, but it's still not one of the, the big sports in Japan. When the Olympics come next year, then it will be much more noticeable. The sure. Japanese people are very, very much into the Olympics. I mean, that, that is a huge thing here. Um, but yeah, if you're in Oita or Shizuoka, you can see a lot of events, probably a lot more signs and trappings of the Rugby World Cup. But once it gets going, as I, I remember when the Soccer World Cup was on, like the actual venues and, and around the city, once the fans actually come in and there's you know, groups of them walking around, you will definitely have more of a tournament feel. But it's not, it, it, just the sheer size and magnitude, because this is the biggest metropolis in the world, mm -hmm. right? So. I think I said to you earlier, people were worried about, you know, what, how is the transportation going to handle the influx of people? Mm. But even if there's, what did they say there was like 400,000 people maybe like coming into the city for certain matches, but Shinjuku Station alone has 3 million people a day passing through it. Mm. So even if every person from every game in the city that day passed through the station, still wouldn't really affect yeah. <laughs> you know? So, it, <coughs> excuse me, in that sense, I, I can see where you're coming from, in yeah. that it might not look, but I think you'll be fine. Once, once the tournament actually gets going, 
people will be more into it, you know. Uh, on a final point, then you're obviously going to be covering a lot of the games. You may have, a, you definitely have a better knowledge of the Japan team than a lot of other Irish journalists working over here. Are they a threat? Uh, are they a possible threat to go through and perhaps beat Scotland if they don't get the job done against Ireland? I would favour them to beat Scotland, to be honest with you. Right. Okay. Um, I know they haven't done it before. I was when the Irish team were here in 2017. I actually took the Irish team to see Sumo mm. a couple of times, and you know. Um, they seem to have dropped off a little bit from the highs then, so I, I still think it would, it would be a huge upset, obviously, if Japan beat Ireland. Uh, the thing with the Scotland game is that I think Japan plays Scotland in the last game of the yeah. group, and also Japan have a much longer rest, whereas the last time Japan won three games and then had to play Scotland yeah. almost immediately, so it was, it was a really unfair situation in that sense, like, you know, they should really have progressed with three wins. Um, I think... I could see them upset Scotland, and I have a sneaking suspicion that, given the way it's set up, that they will. Right. So, I wouldn't be surprised either way, but uh, I, I wouldn't see Japan beating Scotland as that much of an upset. You know, I think they could get that first win. Being on home soil gives them that extra boost, you know, and there's a lot of stuff that they've been kind of hiding and keeping back. They have good, solid players. Uh, the team definitely has gelled and come together a lot more than it was even a couple of years ago. There was a real letdown like after the last World Cup and you know, mm. there's a whole series we could do on that yeah. as well. But uh, I've covered a lot of the games and I cover Super Rugby as well. So I've seen a lot of their players with Sun Wolves and, and other things. So if Scotland, I don't think Scotland will underestimate them at all. You know, they did beat South Africa in the last mm. World Cup, you know. So, but if there is any complacency, I could see Japan take advantage of it. Against Ireland, I think it's probably a step too far. Right, okay, very interesting. Well, enjoy the tournament, John. It's been great chatting to you, and uh, best of luck as well with uh, all the sumo coverage over the next couple of months. Yeah, great stuff, and hopefully I'll see you at the games, hopefully, and um, yeah. we'll meet at the final. <laughs> you know, let's hope so. We'll be on the pitch, we'll, we'll do a follow-up to this on, on the final, you know. We'll carry the trophy around the field with the team, you know. So. That's a deal, that's a deal. We'll see, we'll see you then. Thanks, right. William, John.